know, I thought this morning's panel was uh, extremely interesting. We heard about the insights from three veterans, from a diplomatic, from a military, from a humanitarian relief uh, point of view. Um, and we were treated to the Kurdish point perspectives from the foreign minister and his Washington representative and a leading scholar. Some members on this afternoon's panel were also involved in Operation Provide Comfort, either indirectly or uh, directly uh, uh, on the ground. But all of their experiences from both the morning panel and this evening, uh, this afternoon's panel will be, will inform the policy challenge that are faced in the region in the future. Our luncheon speaker today, a real treat, uh, because he brings a wealth of experience across several disciplines in the Middle East uh, to the topic. General Zinni uh, is truly one of those soldier-scholar diplomats, a rare combination. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the uh, United States Marine Corps when he graduated from Villanova, and he rose to the rank of four-star general. His military service took him to over 70 different countries, including deployments just about everywhere, in the Mediterranean, the Caribbean, Western Pacific, Northern Europe, Korea, Vietnam. He was involved in emergency relief and security operations in the Philippines, which no doubt uh, informed his later service in Operation Provide Comfort. In 2000, General Zenni retired from the United States Marine Corps after serving three years as Commander-in-Chief at Central Command, responsible for military personnel and operations from Egypt through Pakistan. Truly a scholar, diplomat, soldier, General Zenni uh, served his nation in retirement in several civilian uh, diplomatic posts, including the Middle East Peace Process uh, and others. He has held academic positions at VMI, Duke, Cornell, the University of California, the Joint Forces Staff College, William and & Mary, and of course his alma, alma mater, uh, Villanova. Uh, he's also been affiliated with uh, research institutions such as the Middle East Institute, uh, and has, he has been a board, boardroom leader and executive at BAE Systems and DynCor. And I have had the pleasure, the true pleasure, of working with him and his capacity as honorary chairman of the Middle East Institute. Um, his keynote remarks <clears throat> will draw on his experiences with General Jamerson, who I'm very pleased is with us today, and others of you who are also present today in establishing a military presence in northern Iraq and working with coalition partners, the international relief community uh, and the Kurd Kurdish community themselves. As I mentioned this morning, please take a look at the really uh, moving photos that uh, have been provided by General Zidi, and I promise we will give them back. <laughs> uh, but we uh, all very much appreciate uh, seeing them here today. I look forward to hearing his uh, reflections, and um, as a strategist, and as an American officer, and as a very uh, caring human being. After his prepared remarks, uh, General Zenni will ask, take a few questions from the audience, and we'll close this session at about 1.30 and begin our second panel. Tony. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, what I thought is I'd do is talk a little bit about Operation Provide Comfort. I know, obviously, the panel's uh, participants have given you uh, some of the reflections and some of the parts of this, but it, to, to sort of quote what Andrew said about this being a complex operation, I don't think you'll get an appreciation for the complexity unless you really take a, a quick look at all the parts, all the components that made up this operation. I'd like to do that and then give you some reflections about maybe what went right, what we learned uh, uh, that we could do better, and maybe a little bit about how that influenced how the military did business in the future. On the 5th of April in 1991, 
I was the Deputy Director of Operations at the European Command of Stuttgart, Germany. And one of my uh, other jobs was to be the director of the battle staff. Now, the battle staff, or a crisis action team, for those of you who are not in the military, is formed up when you have an operation going down, or a mission, or a crisis. And it comes out of the hide of the staff because it has to be manned 24-7. The European Command had had the battle staff in being for over a year, for different reasons. We did a number of non-combatant evacuations in, in uh, Africa. We had... Uh, 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 situation ongoing, obviously, with the wall coming down, the reunification of Germany, a number of issues. One of the parts, and this may be the most important and critical part in saving lives, was that we had a proposal from General Jamerson, the United States Air Force in Europe, to open up a second front in Iraq as the Gulf War, Desert Storm, uh, was being planned uh, in the Desert Shield stages and the operations in the South were ready to be uh, commenced. And General Jamerson had proposed that we could actually, operating out of Turkey, conduct air and special operations missions that would take care of the northern part of Iraq and the forces up there that were difficult for General Schwarzkopf and CENTCOM to reach. CENTCOM approved and Operation Proven Force was put in place. General Jamerson was the commander and it operated out of Incirlik and Diyarbakir and, and places down in southeast Turkey. Uh, basically, air operations, some special operations missions, some uh, recovery and rescue of, uh, uh, of pilots. And it was ongoing right up until the early stages of April. On the 5th of April, we were getting ready to shut down our crisis action team and our battle staff. And believe me, the staff was anxious for this to happen. There were a lot of tired people going through all the myriad operations we were running at the same time. During that day, because it was our intent on the 5th of April to close it down by the end of the day, we kept getting reports that something was going on in northern Iraq. And the reports had us kind of gin up our interest and the potential that we might be committed, since obviously we had proven force operation going on up there. But we kept being called off, started up and called off. We then got a request that the Secretary of State, James Baker, and you've heard reference to this, was in Israel and had decided he wanted to go up and see what the situation was in southeast Turkey and obviously what was happening with the Kurdish population that was being brutalized and chased into the mountains of uh, southern, uh, southeastern Turkey. We were asked to provide transportation for him to get out to the camps. And so two Navy CH-53 heavy lift helicopters, you can see some of the pictures when they come up and outside, were tasked to support him. And he flew to Turkey and then flew down into the camps. We had shut down operations in European command, as I said, with the battle staff, when suddenly that night we got a call saying that Secretary Baker had seen on the ground what was happening was horrified at what was happening. I, didn't, I think someone had referenced, I think Ambassador Kimmett, that he was moved emotionally, and I tell you he was. And he co contacted the president, and the next thing we were told, within 36 hours, you will have relief supplies on the ground to those Kurds that are in the hills in, in southeast uh, uh, Turkey. Now remember, we had nothing on the ground. We had pulled out. And we didn't even know where they were. We didn't even understand what was happening, or who the Kurds were, really, because the European command, uh, that was not part of our area of responsibility. That was Central Command. The first decision that was made is to take General Jamerson and his proven force uh, units and put them back into Turkey right away, along with General Dick Potter and his special operations staff. Two missions, one to General Jamerson was you know, continue uh, to deploy the kinds of forces you had, but add a capability to airdrop relief supplies. We had 36 hours to get the first relief supplies on the ground, and to General Potter, Special Forces, and a commander of our Special Operations component in UCOM, to go out and do an assessment, what was happening on the ground, what we needed. Now, I want to tell you some of the remarkable things that were accomplished by uh, our Air Force and our Special Operations Units. Within 36 hours, General Jamerson had 37 tons of release supplies airdropped into those areas where the Kurds were in the hills. 
Now this was winter. There was eight feet, 18 feet of snow in some of the passes up there. It was brutally cold. When General Potter went into some of those areas, he realized we needed to stabilize those populations up there. I mentioned earlier today that it, we learned that about there were about 10,000 deaths up there during the time leading up to this and obviously after we first got in and before we could stabilize the population. That we had something close to 500,000 uh, displaced persons, refugees, and in tremendously bad shape. General Potter immediately called for the 10th Special Forces Group, the entire group, to come out because he felt he needed that kind of capability. He would later be reinforced by a Royal Marine Commando Unit, a battalion-sized Royal, Royal Marine Commando Unit for the scope of what he had to do. Basically, what we call Task Force Alpha, General Potter and his crew had to take care of those 500,000 Kurds in those extreme conditions. We set up eight camps, and when I say we, we were beginning to see the flow of coalition forces come in from the various nations that support us. Eight camps and 43 other locations had to be maintained to stabilize them there. We began and, and we continued the airdropping of food, potable water, medical supplies, obviously tenage and the things we needed to stabilize them in, in those hills. It looked like that something more had to be done. They could obviously not be sustained in the hills under those conditions. We were being advised that very rapidly, April goes into spring and, and winter into a summer conditions. Much of the water supplies would dry up up there, and this difficult terrain, this mountainous terrain, some of the pictures that you could see, would not be a place that we could sustain that large a population. So we realized that something was going to have to be done in moving large numbers of people into a more sustainable area. The question was, where would that area be? Would it be in Turkey? Would it be some sort of small place we carved out in northern Iraq? What are the political implications of that? So we went from this emergency relief operation measured in hours to what was going to become a mission that lasted 13 years or 12 years, all the way up to provide comfort two and then Northern Watch. When we decided that there had to be more forces, and obviously the nations that were willing to provide forces were beginning to pony up the kinds of organizations we felt we needed, medical support teams, infantry units, you know, all sorts of uh, uh, engineer units, all sorts of units we might need, we realized that this could expand to a much larger operation. General uh, John Shalikashvili, who was then the number two for the U.S. Army Europe, was sent down, and he brought this guy, Jay Garner, with him, who we never heard of, and uh, Jay came down with him, and the two of them looked this over, and it was obvious that we're going to expand this and the ground operation, the logistics operation are going to be extensive. So it was decided that General Shalikashvili was ordered by General Galvin, our, our Supreme Allied Commander and his NATO hat and European Command Commander, that General Shalikashvili would take command, General Jamerson would become the deputy, and I would uh, become the chief of staff. General Garner was then given the mission of what we call Task Force Bravo, which is the force we would put inside northern Iraq. Now, I want to say one thing that, that, that Jay Garner did. He had no staff. He came alone. And so we kept talking about, well, we need to get him a staff. We need to bring a staff down. And General Garner says, I'm looking at Jim Jones's Marine Expeditionary Unit, John Abizade's force, and all the other coalition. He says, I don't need a staff. I'll figure it out down there, and I'll take from them, and, and we could put a staff together right away, which he absolutely did. And it was a superb staff. It was a pickup team. And they did magnificent work, as you heard uh, uh, going on today. The whole operation, Provide Comfort One, lasted 80 days. We had to build a distribution network to get the, re the relief supplies out there. The airdropping wasn't going to be enough. Sustaining our forces and the Kurds inside northern Iraq wouldn't be enough. So a distribution network had to be built from Inserlik you know, from the sea bases that we were using there uh, and the air bases and the bases out at the Abakur that the Turks let us use. The problem was, and I want to make this point because it was referred to earlier today, these bases did not have the capacity. One of the things that 
you know, the, the airmen will tell you about is something called uh, maximum on ground, MOG. How many airplanes can you have on the ground in an air base at one time? And when you're limited in that space, you have to rotate them through pretty quickly. Now, when military supplies or military supplies being used for, used for relief come in, you can deal with them pretty quickly because they're palletized, and you can get them on and off. But a lot of well-intentioned people were sending airplanes unannounced to us, and, they were, and, and the supplies they had on there weren't necessarily the kinds of things we needed in the emergency phase of this, and they weren't palletized. So we were beginning to get a lot of heat about not being able to accept relief supplies or to turn them off. And many of these were well-intentioned supplies that were not scheduled, not programmed, were coming in and interfering with our ability to process more efficiently what we needed to get out there. The distribution network was going to be extensive. We were operating in an area the size of Kansas, over 83,000 square miles, if you looked at the entire area of responsibility our coalition task force had. And this required a network going through areas that were not necessarily secure. There was a threat within Turkey, uh, an extremist group called Dev Sol, that there had been some threats against our mission and operation. And obviously, we were operating General Gardner's force down there, faced off against the Iraqi military, the Mukhabarat, the secret police, and other elements down there that created issues of security. And so this distribution network had not only the logistics component of transportation and maintenance and all the other parts and ability to move supplies, but had a security requirement. General Hal Birch, who was the number two logistician for the United States Army in Europe, came down to run the operation. We began to get forces in not only from the 13 nations that had provided military forces, but even from within the US, we were moving logistics forces from Okinawa in because, remember, down in the south, we had units packing up that were in the middle of moving that we could not move up there. So the places we could go to get units, U.S. units and even some of the coalition units were very limited. But fortunately, as was mentioned before, we got high quality troops. You know, Royal Marines, uh, uh, the, the French paratroopers, special forces, and so the quality of the troops we were getting in that were sent by all the nations was exceptional. And the support elements they were bringing, field hospitals, uh, kitchens enabled, that enabled us to uh, feed those that, that, that needed, obviously, the kinds of foods that we needed to provide uh, to sustain them and to get them back into a healthy condition were absolutely necessary. The key element in understanding how to deal with our partners on this battlefield, Andrew Natsios and the uh, uh, USAID, uh, the, the, the various relief, relief agencies, we had to have this glue that held us together. From the military side, we were very fortunate in that at the European Command, we had two excellent captains, uh, Dave Elmo and Mike Hess, who's here today, that pulled on the coattails of myself and uh, my boss, the, the J3 at the time, uh, Admiral Leighton Smith, and said, we know how to do this. You know, we can organize a civil military operations center, and the civil affairs units need to be out there in force to be able to support this operation. Eventually, we deployed an entire civil affairs group under uh, Brigadier General Don Campbell, who was a reservist. He was a judge from New Jersey that left and came out there to run that civil affairs uh, component. The United States Embassy in Ankara also was in full support mode. Ambassador Obramowitz sent Mark Grossman down, who's in the audience, to be our liaison, and so we had a team from there. Uh, Andrew mentioned the DART team under Dayton Maxwell that came out and helped us with the assessment. The total number of troops we had out there on the ground, coalition, 13 nations said before, came to 23,242 military, and that did not count the carrier battle group, and other support elements that weren't in the immediate area of responsibility but supported this mission. Uh, we also had 117 civilians that were part of our organization, and we had liaison teams from the United Nations, particularly the largest one, 80-some 80, 80 people, 
from the High Commissioner of Refugees, Madame Agat herself, who was the director at that time, came down. And so we had a team working with us on how to handle uh, refugee situations. And I learned the difference between refugees and displaced persons and the fact you can't move people across borders unless you document it. And the Kurds being very productive in terms of having little babies up in the hills made it even more difficult to catalog all that. But we wanted to get it right. Despite the emergency nature of all this, we wanted to have the capacity to get this all right. We, uh, we had, uh, beside that, uh, we had a number of uh, national command elements that had civilians supporting them also. So if, for example, the British and the Italian had operational forces that they passed control to us to, uh, uh, to, to obviously direct during the military operation, they also brought down a civilian contingent. And part of that was their, their representative in terms of uh, their embassies, and part of that was their contribution. Over 30 nations provided relief supplies. And so in addition to the United States uh, and to the 13 nations that provided forces, a total of 30 nations provided a continuous flow of relief supplies that were critical. We began, obviously, as I mentioned, to use airdrops. That's a very inefficient way to do business. As a matter of fact, we, had, we were conducting the largest uh, airdrop in the history of the United States military to that point. We had the greatest number of riggers, and riggers are people that prepare those bundles and put them together for airdrop and, and parachuting, we had the largest number ever brought together in one place from all services and from our coalition partners as well. Now, we talk a lot about the relief and the humanitarian piece of this, but there's another piece of this, and that I think Jay, uh, Jay Garner and Dick Potter faced off against, and that was the threat. Our coalition lost seven killed in action. We had 140 wounded or injured in this operation. And it's not just a matter of things like mines and explosive devices that affected us, but just the nature of these kinds of operations in this very austere environment makes it a dangerous business. And so there was a price that was paid. Those seven soldiers, Marines, the, uh, those from other forces in our coalition, and then the 140 that were wounded or killed or excuse me, injured, and as Jay had said before, some of whom lost limbs because of the mines that were still present in that area. I want to talk a little bit about how our mission evolved, because there's a term in the military called mission creep. Mission creep means when you want to get on the ground and the mission you started off with isn't enough or not working, and you begin to take the initiative on the ground and stretch the mission out without political approval or understanding or knowledge, you get in front of the headlights of our leadership, that's not a good thing. What I want to say, another part of this that made it work, and I, I attribute much of this to people like Ambassador Kimmett, is the connection that we had from Washington, from Secretary Cheney and, and Secretary Baker, from the President, right down to Ambassador Abramowitz, to our commander, General Galvin, right down to General Shalikashvili, right down to our two task force commanders, General Garner and General Potter, were direct. And every time we saw a need to expand the mission, we went immediately back and immediately got approval for the, the mission to expand. So we were not doing something on the ground that our bosses and our political leadership didn't understand. I think that's a critically important point because I would offer to you, you know, I, I was involved in Somalia, three tours, and a number of other missions where that kind of connection wasn't in place. So that was another benefit for us in what we did. Our initial task was to provide immediate relief and stabilize the popula population in place. And then it went into, as I said, to build a distribution system and the infrastructure for continuous support for them as we looked at what we needed to do in, over time. We then were tasked with establishing a security zone in northern Iraq, and initially this was very small. It eventually would be expanded to include all of the Kurdish area. And, uh, and the uh, advice we received from the United Nations is don't build refugee camps, take them home. I can remember to this day the liaison from the United Nations telling us whatever you do, talking to your political masters, get the permission to provide security to get everybody home. 
And that became the, the driving force for not only us, but for the decision makers back in the capitals of all those nations that were providing forces. We were then told, and, and ordered to construct temporary facilities, uh, transit camps, way stations, support networks, to get the Kurds out of the mountains and bring them down into where we could settle them and then eventually get them home. This was no small task. I mean, moving them out of the mountains took a lot in the way of logistics. Obviously, you have a very traumatized population. There was hesitancy in some cases uh, in, in their willingness to come back, uncertainty. We had made an agreement with a number of the leaders and the, the, the Agas and the tribal leaders and political leaders about bringing certain of their uh, members down to look at the situation, to get assurance that, that they were uh, going to be safe and secure and we were committed to this mission. In the first camps we built, when we brought their, their initial people down to look at them, they didn't like the setup. We had nice, neat military rows, and they said, that's not the way we live. So we had to redo all the camps, and then we were told by them, we don't want you to do all the work. So we request that you take a lot of our young men, bring them down, and have them help construct the temporary camps. And so we accommodated them. We brought a bunch of the young men out of the camps down there to work on them. I think that psychologically, this was an excellent move. And certainly, it, it went further to build that kind of relationship we had with the Kurds there. Just one little aside and a small story. I was at one of those camps while they were being constructed, and we had a number of Kurdish young men working on them. And a young Kurdish man came up to me, and he, he spoke a little English. He said, I don't have anything. I lost everything. He said, but I want to thank you for what you're doing. And he handed me a rose. And he said, roses grow wild here in Kurdistan. This isn't much, but it is a symbol of my thanks. And I said, that is more than enough, you know. And I still have it pressed somewhere in my, uh, somewhere between those pictures I brought here, I think. But that part of it convinced us that we needed to obviously push back the Iraqi military we set up the Military Coordination Center, uh, Dick Nab in charge, who's sitting here. And Dick's job was uh, one none of us really envied. He had to deal with General Nishwan Danoon, right? And Saber, Lieutenant General Saber, when he came up from Baghdad. And, and so with Jay Garner and General Shalikas, really, they'd go for those root canals and meeting with them. And we would basically issue the demarches and tell them, back off. And there were a few firefights that uh, took place to convince them we meant business and Jay's people meant business. And I want to say something here about that because this is something that perplexed us back at the higher headquarters. A lot of this was bluff. We didn't have the military forces on the ground should Saddam, who had five divisions up there that had not been in the war in the south. So they weren't cowed by Desert Storm. And they were pretty aggressive. Every once in a while, they'd take a pot shot at our airplanes or something. And so we were there convincing him, we'll take you on. As Jay said, you know, if you get in our way, we will take you out of our way. But yet, we could not bring in the kinds of forces that would assure us to have the military capability to do that because the distribution network was so fragile and thin, relief supplies took priority. So we required, we required Jay, Jay to be out there bluffing in his finest uh, Clint Eastwood, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger manner to back him off, which worked. We then had the responsibility and the task to transfer the, the population down. And as I said before, that was very difficult. They were, as I said, traumatized. In many cases, we were beginning to see uh, the start of cholera, dysentery, really affecting young and old most. And so that was a, a major undertaking that Dick Potter had to accomplish to get them down to where they could be turned over to, to Jay and brought in, into northern Iraq and eventually back home. And then we, have to, we had to transfer from the humanitarian operation to the security operation. And so all this took 80 days before we set up Provide Comfort 2, which is the sustainment of a security zone for the Kurds to to, to live within it in, in a sense of security from the threats Saddam had posed. There were some touching moments down there and things that we experienced. Uh, there was one mention about Halabja and the, one of the places that had been gassed by Saddam back in the 80s. There was a request by the Kurds to see if we could look at reconstructing that. Many people from there would like to go back. We actually sent some of our 
uh, our teams down there, military teams, to look to see if there was still contamination in the area, and there was. So they could not go back. As we scraped the ground, we were still getting uh, residue and remains from uh, the gas that was used. But we, the effort, and I think uh, Andrew Natsios and others described the commitment in terms of funds, and, throw, and so all the way up to 2003, uh, when we went in there, we ended up obviously bringing the Kurds back to a place that they could uh, exist and exist in a way that they didn't feel threatened. I'm gonna give you my take on maybe what we should take away in, in reflection from this and all this. Uh, the command and control, since this was a pickup team and there was no planning, was very difficult to accommodate. There were no plans at that time in the European Command or Central Command or anywhere else for a contingency to operate in a complex humanitarian environment with the security threats. As a result of Provide Comfort in Somalia and a number of other operations in the Balkans, you'll find those now at, at our combatant command headquarters. That wasn't the case then. So this was all new in, in what we were doing. And with the, everybody coming in with a sense of urgency and a need to get down on the ground and us trying to get them out there to the scene of the crime, we were very creative in command relationships. Uh, Jay told the story of when I had to brief uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Colin Powell, who was pretty savvy as he, you know, us military people always show you a plumbing diagram of command relationships, and I put up my plumbing diagram, which was absolutely bogus, but I had to show the chairman something. And of course, General Powell, as astute as he is, looked at it, smiled, and said, Zinni, what are these command relationships? This, this uh, tactical control, operational control, tack on? And that's when I, I, I figured I better not try to bluff the, the chairman. And I said, sir, it's Hancon. When these forces are coming in, we tell them, there's the area you need to operate in. This is what you need to do. This is your boss, you know, General Garner or General Potter. Go do it. Not even a, 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 a whisper of what are the relationships, what are the missions. Everybody was can do. Everybody wanted to get out there and do something. And we never had an issue of command and control, and we never had an issue as to who was in charge or who made the decisions. And I would say something about General Sholley in all this, because the senior commanders from these other 12 nations, they would come in and, and at General Sholley's request, he would have once a week a dinner with the coalition commanders. And he would suggest to them what we might be doing next in, as these missions unfolded and what roles they might play. And the reason he did it that way before we issued an order when we had the time to do that is, not, is to not surprise them, not give them a mission that maybe politically might be more difficult or they have to call back to, to Rome or London or whatever to get the okay. And I watched General Sholley as he was a master in dealing with the coalition forces and understood how to take care of any political sensitivities to make sure they were part of the process as we were planning on the go. I had requested as chief of staff that I did not want liaison officers, I wanted planners from all the forces. So they could be involved in what we call in the military future plans, future operations, not just the current operations. So they could tell us what their capabilities are and what they could do. Now, it's easy to look at the United States commitment and say, well, you know, it's the biggest part of this, and that's what mostly we talk about. But I would tell you that of those 23,000 troops, we had 12,000 plus, but the coalition had 11,000. And in many cases, some of these units had experience or capabilities that we didn't necessarily have. The first time we were entering Iraq, the first city or town there was Zaku. And we had to go into this area not knowing what we would find. We didn't know if it, if it was a functioning city. We knew there were some civilians still in there. The Mukhabarat, the secret police were still there. The Peshmerga were beginning to move in. And one of the units we led with was one of the Royal Marine Commando units that had just come back from Belfast and were doing this kind of business for six, seven months. And so they were experienced in this. The French provided these mobile units. When we had to find out what was on those trails leading up to the mountains where we had the camps, we needed to have highly mobile, you know, highly agile forces that can go through that area and see what happened to all those Kurds as they fled there. And, and I want to tell you, the stories were horrific. But General Maurice Lepage and his French forces 
Highly Mobile took care of that business. They had the right kind of equipment, and the right kind of experience in doing that. So it was not just a collection of forces. Again, we were fortunate enough to have the right kind of people. Command and control has another aspect of it beyond just command relationships. It's the ability to talk to each other. Now we were, with the exception of the Australians, we were all NATO nations. It wasn't a matter of language. It was a matter of communication equipment. Despite this interoperability of NATO and everything else, we had to bring in 1,600 short tons of co communications equipment just to be able to connect to each other, which should have said something about where we were, where we thought we were in terms of NATO. And that was another lesson learned. Uh, we, also, we also learned maybe the biggest lesson to come out of this was the relationship of the military to the NGOs and PVOs, the non-governmental organizations, private volunteer organizations, and then our own relationships within our government, as Andrew pointed out, to USAID, State Department. And that was a work in progress. Uh, a lot of what was learned there was carried on. Later on, uh, when I commanded the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force, and we were answering to CENTCOM, the, the CENTCOM commander that followed General Schwarzkopf directed us and he funded it too, which was nice, is to run a series of exercises called Emerald Express. And Emerald Express was to take the lessons we had learned from operations like Provide Comfort, like Provide Hope, and a number of the others from the 1990s were full of these humanitarian disaster relief operations and try to capture those lessons learned. And the exercise brought in NGOs, associations of NGOs, international organizations like the United Nations, regional organizations, especially from places like Africa and other places where they may be more prone to these kinds of missions, and to learn how to work together, to try to figure out what we had done right and wrong, where the rubs were. Uh, we found one thing in, in Operation Provide Comfort as the organizations that came in, over 50 of them, organizations like Doctors Without Frontiers and others, they had particular places they wanted to go. They had particular things they wanted to do. They did not obviously subject themselves to our direction, which they shouldn't have. So we said, tell us where you want to go and what you want to do, and we'll fill in around you. So if we had a gap in medical support somewhere on, uh, in some area, we can fill in with the military unit. So we learned how to cooperate in a way where civilian organizations who cannot be seen or do not desire or by charter can't be under some sort of military control we can cooperate and coordinate in ways that don't create those kinds of problems. And I think our first experiences there were important in what we learned and carried on after that. And I want to go back to the Civil Affairs Group because they were a major part of creating that relationship from, from the military side as, as well. Uh, it also allowed the military after that to take a hard look at what we, the military, can provide in, in terms of disaster relief and humanitarian assistance. It allowed us to go catalog not just the obvious thing, I mean, we have engineer units, we have ration units, and that sort of thing, but things like contracting. One of the things that Ambassador Obramowitz told us, you're airdropping a lot of stuff, you're lifting a lot of stuff by helicopter, that's a very expensive way to do business. What you should do is contract from locals in Turkey, maybe even Kurdistan, for the food, hire local transportation, and get into distributing it on the ground. Logistically, we went, we, we, we cut our costs by doing that by 80%. It became much more efficient to contract to be able to handle it when we got into the sustainment phase than to maintain the military provision of, of things like uh, MREs and tray rations and, and then moving them by helicopters and C-130s and airdropping. So these are the kinds of lessons that were critical to us in cataloging what we can bring. And there were many more. I mean, the Civil Military Operations Center, Civil Affairs that now had a, a, maybe a new evolving role, this, this connection that, that we could create to the NGOs and PVOs and, and others. I go back to that mission creep versus mission assessment and then mission assignment. You know, one thing I learned as a commander of U.S. Central Command, at the top you got politics and policy. Next you got strategy. Next, you've got the operational design, and then you have the tactics and how you're going to execute it on the ground. They easily get out of alignment. And I would offer to you in the last couple of operations, they got way out of alignment. It's a fight to keep them aligned. And it takes all the way up to the, the secretaries, people like Ambassador Kimmett, down to the combatant commanders, 
down to their counterparts, those in the other government agencies, and on the ground, you know, where we are, to people like Dick Potter and, and, and Jay Garner, Garner that have to make it work. If you get them out of alignment, I saw them get out of alignment many, many times, uh, then the missions are doomed, and the friction takes over, and it becomes a major part of the operation ra rather than accomplishing the mission. One other lesson we learned is the value of cultural intelligence. And the things we were doing and not understanding who we were dealing with and what was happening became critical. We had an intelligence officer named Nell Nesbitt. She was uh, born in Turkey and came to the United States uh, to get her college education, stayed in the United States, became a citizen, and she was an Army intel officer, lieutenant colonel at the time, and she spoke Kurdish. Her father had been a three-star general in the Turkish Army, and she said, you're doing these things that are all wrong. She said, you need to understand who you're dealing with, this population. You need to have a cultural appreciation for who they are, who the leadership is, how their societies are structured. So she managed to find a Kurdish school teacher and we brought her to Interlick, and she became part of our planning team. So everything we did, we consulted her about how we're doing this, who we're talking to, what are the right connections, everything from the kind of food sources we should be contracting for to how the leadership structure is, the tribal leadership, the political leadership, understanding who the Peshmerga were and others that were new to us at that time. And the importance of cultural leadership hit home. And again, it was a lesson that we, we we took uh, away from that. And I would say that uh, to sort of back up what uh, Jay said and what Andrew said, we have to realize that this was a success primarily because of the Kurds. We were dealing with the people that were very resilient, remarkably so, which impressed us all, very courageous and very determined. And obviously a population that given a chance and given the security, were able to take care of themselves and to restructure their society. I spent three tours in Somalia, I told you, and we did not see that there. And as Andrew said, there are other places where you don't get that, that hand dealt to you, where you have a population that you're dealing with that's homogeneous, uh, that they put aside any friction points, that they work together, that they are determined, and they could self-structure, self-organize, and self-commit to what it takes to uh, be able to, uh, to accomplish what we're trying to achieve for them. So these were the lessons that I took away from there. I'll tell you, and I'll leave it with this and we'll go to questions. I was a commander of US Central Command and I had the war plans that every combatant commander has. One of the war plans I had was the Iraq war plan. And the Iraq war plan that I had called for an occupation of Iraq. We did a lot of work in understanding what the post-conflict world in Iraq would be like. We understood that the population, when the regime was popped, was going to be out of control. We understood if the borders weren't under control, that things would come across those borders that would exacerbate this problem. We understood clearly that there were internal issues that had to be dealt with very quickly. We understood that keeping people working, keeping their military intact were necessary. We had a, an exercise called Desert Crossing. We brought in all the intelligence community representatives from every agency to explain to us what we would experience. Every single thing that happened when we went into Iraq was predicted by them. Yet when I looked on the shelf and saw my plan, my plan only addressed the military dimension. My plan only addressed taking down the regime, eliminating the Republican Guard. There was no magic handoff. You know, and so when Jay Garner got stuck with a monumental task with Orha, and then the CPA, who had no clue what they were doing, no experience in there, made horrible decisions. After 10 years of an information operations campaign against the Iraqi regular army, convincing them we would pay them and keep them in beings, this effort was started by my predecessor, General P. They immediately disbanded the army. Their corporate knowledge was erased. And so to go to the point about post-conflict environment that was brought up, because that's where you're gonna find these kinds of situations, and other environments, like when total chaos takes place, like we experienced in Somalia. It's critical to understand what kinds of tasks you have to perform. The military, once you step up and take control, once you commit, you're in for all of it. I hear a lot, of, I've been questioned a lot about setting up no-fly zones in Syria. 
you know, because as a commander of U.S. Central Command, we had the no-fly, no-drive zones. But what I keep saying is you can't get a little bit pregnant. You can't just set up a no-fly zone. You own what goes on underneath that airspace once you, you take a little bit of control over it. You own what the people you're protecting do. You own what others might do that are in there. If you compare the northern no-fly zone to the southern no-fly zone, in the north, as a result of this, we created a no-fly, no-drive zone. No Iraqi forces were allowed in. In the south, we only set up a no-fly zone. So the poor Marsh Arabs and the Shia in the south were brutalized by five of Saddam's divisions he kept there. We never took the extra step. And that's where we have to be careful. I'm all for sanctuaries and keeping refugees home and allowing them to rebuild and to give them the support to do it. But what it takes, and this will be the most important I'd say, is the political will and commitment of those of us that want to make this happen. And without that, it can't be done by piecemeal commitment with limited missions to our military. I'm glad to take any uh, questions that you might have or comments, so thank you. Questions? The microphones are out there. I think there's one over here. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, General Zinni. I, I, I found that extremely illuminating. I'm Lori Milroy. I work for Kurdistan 24. And what I picked up from uh, your comments, as well as what General Garner said earlier about they left us alone, would this be a fair characterization of how Operation Provide Comfort developed? That really what drove the evolution and the development of the operation from originally just being the, the airdrops to what it became, were the officers on the ground, like yourself and the others here, who were really directing their higher-ups in, in Washington as to what needed to be done and responding in a very quick way to um, circumstances that they found that were unexpected that were perhaps changing. Would that be an uh, appropriate way to describe it? Yes, you know, we have, a, we have, a, we have terms in the military called uh, recon pull and command push. Recon pull means uh, it's, it's short term for sending out units or units that are in contact on the ground or units that are at the tactical level that at the command level, those giving orders and directions are listening and hearing what they're seeing and saying. And you're, you're building your direction, your orders based on that. Uh, other considerations come in, certainly. No, that's not the only thing. But there's a voice you want to hear from the bottom up. And oftentimes, we get in a position where they're ignored. What they're facing on the ground is ignored. And, and I would offer to you, we've seen that in the last couple military operations. Believe me, I went out and did an assessment in Afghanistan, one in Iraq. And I'll tell you, what you heard from the sergeants and captains was a heck of a lot different from the generals in the, the, the suits and skirts that were directing operations. And in these kinds of operations, that becomes critically important. That doesn't mean there aren't other considerations. Political considerations and others, it's a fact of life. Clausewitz said, you know, you know war uh, is, is politics by other means. But it means that you are basing, or at least in your consideration for what you're doing, the strategic decisions, the policy decisions, even the political decisions, are being based on what's happening on the ground. Now, it's wonderful to say we were all great guys on the ground and we knew what we were doing. Uh, uh, we hope so. But more importantly is the people above us that were pay grades above us were willing to listen to us. And, you know, and this is both on, uh, on our political side and our very senior military side at that point. You know, from General Galvin you know, on up to the secretaries, uh, all the way up to the White House. Uh, to, to General Scowcroft at the NSC and, and then President Bush himself. And so this dialogue, this back and forth, th this, this interchange never stopped. And so if we made a suggestion, a recommendation, or gave a statement, it was taken seriously. There wasn't brushed aside. It wasn't this sort of command push on direction. So that's a two-way street. I mean, the people you have on the ground are better be, better be those that you trust on above and you trust their judgment. But you've also got to listen to them. And I'll make a statement here I'll probably regret, but you know, not since uh, George Marshall and Franklin Delano Roosevelt 
have we had that kind of relationship. Uh, we did at that moment because General Powell and General Galvin had it with the leadership, with General Scowcroft and with President Bush and with uh, Secretary Baker and, and Secretary Cheney. That is what's got to happen. Uh, that is more important a link than maybe us on the ground, or you know, we can be shouting at a brick wall about what's needed. But everything, you know, Jay Garner and Dick Potter saw at their levels, we made sure that went up the line, and General Galvin did too, and it went right to the White House. It wasn't micromanagement, but it was the need for that input in, in making those decisions. May, sir. Yeah. So uh, we have time for we have time for two questions. Of this lady here, and then the lady in the yellow jacket, please. I'm at Sue Worth. I'm from the Naval Postgraduate School. Yet another wonderful insight from you. Thank you, General. Uh, my, I guess my question is, how do the learnings that came out of what you did get built into the new system, get built into what we're teaching at the academies and at ROTC? I mean, it strikes me as sharing the learning turns out to be a very important piece. Well. Uh in fact, it did in the 90s, very much so. I mean, first of all, there were organizations created, the Army created a peacekeeping uh, organization at Carlisle. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there were operational units like the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force. We were running exercises like uh, Emerald Express, which weren't really exercise in a traditional sense. It was more seminars and conferences on learning how to work with all those you're going to find in this sort of complex environment out there. Courses in our command and staff colleges, our war colleges, uh, the low intensity conflict, uh, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, you were beginning to see more and more courses on that peacekeeping uh, uh, in a permissive environment, non-permissive environment. So these things really began to uh, bubble up. A lot of that got pushed on the back burner once Iraq and Afghanistan took place because we were involved in more of a conventional operation. Uh, there are still places, obviously, that, uh, that exist and specialize in this and still have captured those lessons. I would also mention that every service, plus the joint uh, uh, staff, has a lesson learned organization that are on scene when you're doing this. I mean, there was a lessons learned organization from each of the four services, plus the joint one that came out there. We had people like uh, uh, Professor Gordon Rudd, who, whose book I see floating around here, uh, who captured, he was there and captured much of uh, what went on. And there were a number of service per per perspectives on this too. Each of the services and service doctrine. You were began, we started to see manuals that had been maintained and updated on how to do this business now. I want to go back to the point that the military had a lot to learn, and the military did. But I want to go back to the, to the keys of educating the civilian leadership in charge of this. Not USAID, they know this business really well, but I'm talking about those that make political decisions uh, at, at, at some level and understand what's required. Uh, the worst thing you could do is to try to do some minimal amount for political reasons. I saw that in Somalia when we first went in. And it, we were able to freeze the situation and stop uh, the brutalization of, our, uh, of the NGOs and others and the people. But then a next step never came. The next step was back to the UN, and it was a disastrous mission. So if you decide to commit, you have to decide to commit all the way. And that's a difficult decision. Provide Comfort One started out with 13 nations providing military support, 30 nations providing supplies. When it ended in March of 2003, only two nations were flying Northern Watch. And so that commitment is not only a U.S. commitment, it has to be a coalition commitment. I go back to the point that was mentioned before, I think Ambassador Kimmett made it, if you can do this under something like NATO or the United Nations, it's much better. Obviously, there's burden sharing, there's a sense of commitment, and, and the decisions are made collectively. Thank you for your uh, wonderful remarks. They were riveting. As a non-military person, I, I found them fascinating. Um, my name is Paulette Lee. I'm an international development communications consultant. Uh, could you apply any of those lessons learned to your choice, one current conflict, 
and show how those lessons are or are not being used now? Thank you. Well, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, I'm can. glad to kick that off to the panel that follows, but, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, let me say one thing, and, I, and it goes back to the last comment I just made. If, if, the, if the situation is such that it's imperative that we, and when I say we, the collective we, not just the United States, that we need to do something for humanitarian reasons or civility reasons or security reasons or whatever, and we decide that this kind of commitment, which would be on a much larger scale and much more complex than what we face and provide comfort, in a place like Syria, uh, it's important to go back what I said. The commitment has to be seen as long-term and major. And the military commitment is going to have to be significant. This stupid-ass term, boots on the ground, I don't know where it came from, but you're going to have to have a hell of a lot of boots on the ground to do it, and you can't be afraid to do it. Go back to the Powell Doctrine or the Weinberger Doctrine. If we're going to save lives, if we're going to secure an unstable part of the world that affects us all, make the damn commitment. Thank you.